All right, this section of notes, we're going to be looking at the development and diffusion of agriculture. I'm going to go ahead and apologize ahead of time for my voice. Uh, you're just going to have to bear with me on this section of notes. First thing we're going to look at is uh, economic activities. Hopefully this is a review from your world geography class. There's four different types of economic activities. Primary economic activities. These draw natural resources from the environment. These are jobs where people are physically working with their hands, manual labor type jobs. Uh, maybe they do have equipment, but they're getting the resource straight from the ground. Generally, these are the low income and the pre-industrial nations. Then you have the secondary economic activity. Secondary economic activities that uh, transform raw materials into manufactured goods. Um, for example, the refining of petroleum into gasoline, metals into tools, those sorts of things. Generally, you still have your less developed nations or maybe your newly industrialized nations uh, are here uh, because this would be the factory type jobs. Then you have the tertiary economic activities. This is the economic activities of the service industry. These dominate post-industrial societies uh, and your more developed nations, your developed nations, this is where most of the workers are located, is in the tertiary. Then you have the quaternary economic activity. This economic activity zone uh, is where the research and development is located, uh, management and administration, processing and dissemination of, of information. Um, that's where these jobs are located. These are your professionals. And now dealing with this data that you see here on this table, by comparing economic sectors, the United Kingdom is one example of a post-industrial society with only 1.4% of its population engaged in agriculture and 80.4% in services. The United States is another post-industrial country with 0.7% in agriculture and 79% in services. Russia appears to have moved into post-industrialism as well. Likewise, Mexico has moved away from agriculture at 13.7% towards services at 62.9%, as Iran to a lesser extent. Despite its recent economic boom, 38% of China's population is still employed in agriculture, and Nigeria has the largest percentage of its people, 70%, employed in the primary sector. Now moving on to the origin and spread of agriculture. First thing I want to point out, I want to add a key vocabulary word of agrarian, A-G-R-A-R-I-A-N. Agrarian is a society that relies on the cultivation of the land. And then agriculture. Agriculture is the deliberate tending of crops and livestock in order to produce food and fiber. The world's total agricultural production is at an all-time high today because of mechanization, but we didn't just jump straight into mechanization. We began with the hunters and gatherers. Stones and eventually metals were shaped as tools and weapons, and techniques were developed for efficient gathering and storage of food. These people were nomadic, meaning they followed the herds around and they migrated often. This form of human migration, kind of as a review from the migration unit, is known as transhumans. Transhumans is the type of migration where people are following herds around. Anthropologists believe that human history began in Eastern Africa uh, and then it migrated to different areas into Australia and the Middle East and Asia and then humans migrate to the Americas uh, via the Beringia Land Strait. Then we move on to the Neolithic Revolution. I want to pose a question for you. Why do you think people ended up settling down in one place? Well, that occurs during the Neolithic Revolution. The ability to settle down was based almost entirely on successful cultivation of crops and domesticated animals. Without that, the Neolithic Revolution would not have happened. The Neolithic Revolution occurred independently all around the world over a large span of history. So it's not like all of a sudden all these river valley civilizations developed. It was a large span of history and it happened independently, meaning they didn't get their ideas from each other at the first. The ideas did not diffuse because people didn't know about the world. Uh, this Neolithic Revolution occurred in agricultural hearths. These were where farming practices began and then diffused to other locations near those hearths of areas. This is pre-globalization, meaning they developed on their own. The hearths did not share ideas with other hearths, and it was kind of independently that this occurred.
kind of difficult to find an, Im an accurate image of agricultural hearths because we're not 100% sure. But you can see based on this map where most of them are located. You'll see that there's not one in southern Europe. Um, later a hearth develops in the Mesopotamia or in uh, the Mediterranean area. But at the beginning there's not an agricultural hearth in southern Europe. Traditionally, traditionally the Ganges River Valley um, and the Nile River Valley had very high population densities because of their intensive agriculture based on irrigation. Um, they got a lot out of the land because of irrigation. Uh, also, a staple crop begins to develop in Mesopotamia and in ancient Egypt, um, which was wheat. Uh, and then you can see in uh, Latin America, what eventually becomes known as Latin America, that the Andean cultural hearth of the Inca, um, this cultural hearth, had potatoes as their staple crop. And we'll get to some other staple crops later on in the notes. I do want to point out to you some of the locations of some of these ancient river valley civilizations. Um, one is Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica can be found uh, kind of in Mexico in those areas. Another one that we've talked about is the Andean America. The Andean America is where the Inca are, uh, were in, and in Peru. Uh, you've also got a cultural hearth and an agricultural hearth in West Africa. The one that we think about most predominantly in Africa is the Nile River Valley civilization, um, but you also have that one in West Africa. Uh, and probably the beginning of civilization is Medi uh, the Mesopotamia, uh, or the Fertile Crescent. And then you've also got three others here that you could see in Asia, uh, but I do want to point out to you um, the one in Mesopotamia, because this is the one that probably uh, most of civilization was at. Um, Mesopotamia is also called the Fertile Crescent. Um, it's this fertile area that sometimes kind of looks like a crescent, if you were to take it uh, and, and look at it. My drawing doesn't really look like a crescent, but hopefully you could see that. Um, it's called Mesopotamia because that word refers to land between the rivers. And the rivers that we're talking about are the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. This land was known as Mesopotamia uh, and probably the beginning of civilization. Then I want to look at the changes that occurred because of the Neolithic Revolution. First, you had an increase in reliable food supplies because people were growing and storing. You also had a rapid increase in total, popu total human population. No more starvation because people could produce more. Uh, also, you had job specialization. Priests, traders, and builders began to uh, develop as job opportunities because not everybody had to farm or hunt and gather uh, because of the Neolithic Revolution. You also had widening of gender differences. Men took over agricultural, and then women took over the home, caring for children. Because men controlled agricultural production and controlled the amount of food, and if you were going to survive, basically, a patriarchal system developed. A patriarchal system uh, is when men hold power in the family, economy, and government. And these started to develop because of the Neolithic Revolution. You also had the development of distinction and distinction between settled peoples and nomads. You had social classes of people but, uh, that developed between those who were still hunting and gathering and those who had already settled down and farmed. According to cultural geographer Carl Saar, the earliest forms of plant cultivation was vegetative planting. Vegetative planting is with, in which new plants are produced by direct cloning from existing plants, such as cutting the stems and dividing the roots. Saar believed that vegetative planting probably began in the diverse climates and topography of Southeast Asia, where a wide variety of vegetation existed. Roots, meaning taro and yam, and tree crops of bananas and palm were the first to be vegetative planted. Uh, this diffused north and eastward to China and Japan, and westward through India, Southwest Asia, and Africa and the Mediterranean Sea area. Dogs, pigs, and chickens were, first were the first domesticated animals, and they were first domesticated in uh, Southeast Asia. Sar also found the uh, implementation of seed agriculture, which is the production of plants through annual planting of seeds, uh, and he said this came later after vegetative planting. Most farmers today practice seed agriculture. Sar identified three hearths for seed agriculture in the Eastern Hemisphere. He identified Western India, um, Northern China, and Ethiopia. 
Western India, from Western India, it diffused to Southwest Asia, where they domesticated wheat and barley and grains. Uh, eventually, they used these to feed Europe and the Americas. Also, this area domesticated herd animals, cattle, sheep, and goats. Northern China, from northern China, millet was diffused. Um, rice, not really sure where that developed, probably in Southeast Asia. And then in Eth Ethiopia, you had millet and sorghum. In the Western Hemisphere, he identified um, southern Mexico and northern Peru. In southern Mexico, he said that squash and maize, which was corn, developed. And then in Peru, he said that beans, cotton, and squash were grown. There's also some innovations that increased the production of food. One was irrigation, or the channeling of water to fields. This is why the uh, Neolithic Revolution occurred around the River Valley civilizations, because you had that uh, constant supply of water. Also, plowing was an innovation that was used to loosen and turn soil. Also had fencing. Fencing was used to keep animals out of fields. You had terraces. These were used to provide level fields as well as to uh, collect water as the water runs off of the sides of hills and things. Also, you had fertilizing, which fertilizing back during this time period was mainly using animal waste or poo. Uh, and then weeding. Weeding was to support the desirable crop by getting rid of the other crops. Through increased trade and other interactions, people shared ideas and shared crops. Food in the Western and Eastern Hemispheres were completely different before the Columbian Exchange. Uh, the Columbian Exchange. Uh, the European exploration and conquest of the Western Hemisphere in the late 15th and 16th centuries led to the exchange of products between Western and Eastern Hemispheres, with new trade routes across the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans connecting to established trade routes. For the first time in world history, trade routes encircled the globe. Uh, and this graphic here kind of shows you some of the things that were traded, and some of them are not actual products. Some of them are actually bad things like diseases uh, that were traded to the Americas. Um, but the exchange that went on from the Americas, uh, you have things like squash, uh, you have things like pumpkins, turkeys, corn, beans, um, sweet potatoes, peppers, peanuts, chilies, chocolate, uh, potatoes, avocados, pineapples, and manioc. Uh, and then coming in from the old ward, world, the eastern hemisphere, uh, you have things like uh, wheat, rice, barley, oats, um, those grains that we see, those come from uh, the, the old world, the eastern hemisphere. You also have rice, olives, grapes, bananas, rice, uh, citrus fruits, melons, figs, sugar, coconuts, okra, horses, cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, rabbits, and rats. It is not important that you understand all of these. Ones that I would make sure I understood was where grains came from. Um, I would also make sure that I could identify which side corn, squash, beans, and turkeys came from. Uh, and not necessarily to, to say that the, all the other ones are unimportant, but uh, these are the ones you might see again. Then we have the second agricultural revolution. The second agricultural revolution began in Western Europe during the 1600s. This intensified agricultural production by promoting higher yields per acre and per farmer. That means out of each acre and out of each farmer, you're getting more food. The second agricultural revolution occurred before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it was around the same time, but it wasn't at the same time. Therefore, it never drew workers away from the cities. Uh, it was before that time period. But what it did was it made it possible to feed the rapidly growing cities. Beginning in the early 1700s, wealthy landowners in England began to enlarge their farms through what was known as enclosure, or fencing or hedging large blocks of land for experiments with new techniques of farming. These scientific farmers improved crop rotation methods, which carefully controlled nutrients in the soil. Uh, this allowed for one crop to be grown during one growing season, and then immediately after it was taken from the soil, uh, there was a new cro there was another crop that was then planted, which they knew could grow during that harvesting or during that time period. You also had Jethro Toll's seed drill. This seed drill more effectively planted seeds and had produced higher yields. This better nutrition boosted England's population, creating the first necessary component for the Industrial Revolution, which was labor.